Hooligans continues now on BBC Two. As you might expect, there's very strong language, violence and racist views in tonight's programme, and there'll be a BBC I interactive forum debate about the issues raised afterwards. It's the first day of the football season. Cardiff, more than many cities, is touched by its darker side. We seem to see a re-emergence of thuggery. You get damaged to property, you get injuries, people are injured. There's contact between uh, the Cardiff supporters and those visiting. And they will arrange to meet, uh, and, and almost battle lines are drawn. If you come into Cardiff, then you're coming into Wales, you're coming into, into their area, and they're very tribal about stuff like that, you know, because people have got an affinity to that club because it's the focal point of their community. It, that represents them because of the numbers they've got. I mean, if everyone is wary of going down to Cardiff. Ninian Park, the home of Cardiff City Football Club. A small hardcore group of hooligans here, the Soul Crew, have one of the worst reputations in the country. Cardiff season in the second division starts against Wickham Wanderers. The vast majority of Cardiff supporters are friendly and well behaved, though travelling fans get a fair amount of abuse. After Cardiff take the lead, much of the shouting is directed at the away supporters. The uh, passion of, uh, of support uh, is intense. It's, it's something you can't describe. The atmosphere, sometimes people say, is electric. Uh, and that is the way it, it is in, at Ninian Park. But there's intensity, um, and there's that point which it moves beyond intensity into hatred. Um, and that, unfortunately, can happen at Cardiff from time to time. Within hours, some will look for trouble with fans from bigger clubs. Nearby, Cardiff's Millennium Stadium is the charity shield match between Manchester United and Liverpool the next day. And some Manchester United fans are already arriving. As Cardiff is still playing, Manchester fans take over one of the Cardiff supporters' pubs. Using hidden cameras, we set out to see what will happen. Which team are you supporting today? I'm Cardiff. No, not Cardiff, man. It's my new in there. Yeah. With Cardiff supporters excluded, United fans are jubilant. But some local fans don't like it. They're now crowded around another pub, the Borough, just around the corner. Among them are known hooligans, members of Cardiff's soul crew. Suddenly, a mob of United fans leave, apparently trying to reach the Cardiff fans. Cardiff run towards them. Police attempt to keep them apart by pinning back the United fans. But Cardiff are now mobbed into one large group. 
there's nothing like that indescribable buzz when it's something is just about to go off. Unless you've been there and in, involved in it, it's very difficult to explain and to understand it. It's very difficult to replace. They charge at the police. chanting Soul Crew, now believed to be one of the biggest hooligan groups in the country. As the police try to regroup, there appear to be people coming from all sides. Officers are being pushed to their limits. Some Cardiff fans are on the hunt for anyone from across the border. I can smell fucking English. Smell it? It's the smell of fucking English. Others have confronted the United fans who are being escorted away by police. We had him with 20 on this now, we're running back in the escort like two yeah. shit. 20 of them come out, give it a fucking stud there, like we went over to them, bang bang, they were gone, run back into the escort like funny as so fuck. Football violence soon melts into the sort of Saturday night trouble known to most British towns and city centres. By now, the Cardiff fans have returned to their pub, the Borough. Another match day is over. This is a South Wales police football intelligence sheet. It focuses on people they associate with Cardiff hooliganism. Most of these men have several football-related convictions. Some were present during the trouble that weekend. But most of those who were involved aren't even known to the police. This is the main website for the Soul Crew's activities. The site offers advice for those who get arrested. The links page gives you access to a world of hooligan sites, run and followed by a network of people across England, Wales and beyond, from very different professions. I know people that are unemployed, I know people that are school teachers, people just do it because they enjoy it. With me it was just like an escapism because I was like living in a bad situation with stepdad and that and I couldn't really stand up to him, you know. So. When I went to Chelsea, it was just like, I was just escaping from it. I could immerse myself in that and take out my frustrations. To have all the police worrying about what our group was doing, it just gave me a sense of importance and a sense of, sense of you know, worth. At football, Wells also joined a small right-wing group of political extremists, Combat 18. But a lot of C18 supporters were so into football anyway. We had a lot of the same objectives, a lot of the same goals. Whereas in C18 we were looking to promote a political agenda, we still enjoyed the violence of the, the English hooliganism. And the routine skirmishes of football violence can have far greater consequences, both social and political. For everything, there is a beginning. For the Olympics, it was ancient Greece. Football's birthplace is England. And when After the success of Euro 96, there was optimism about the English 
and the ability to police it. The government spent £10 million to try and stage the 2006 World Cup in England. There was competition from Germany and South Africa. But some of those promoting the bid felt that hooliganism was an issue that still hadn't gone away and could derail it. They were worried the government hadn't recognised the problem. I just feel that, um, that they weren't really in full grasp of the reality of the situation. I don't think they really fully understood how serious the matter was. Although new anti-hooligan laws were passed, they fell short of stopping known thugs travelling to England games abroad. As the bidding process for the World Cup neared its end, the Euro 2000 tournament began in Belgium and Holland. 1,000 fans from England, the huge majority peaceful, joined supporters from all over Europe. But the bid's promoters were worried. There were so many problems that were not being addressed that trouble was inevitable. It was inevitable. England's crucial game against Germany was to be held in a small town 30 miles from Brussels. The Germans was a big game in Charleroi and everyone knew that was going to be the top thing. Who in their right mind would want to miss the Germans in Euro 2000? Already there were many hooligan groups, or firms, making plans to travel to support England. But perhaps the least expected was Welsh, the sole crew. And at least one convicted Cardiff hooligan decided to make the trip. Shane Weldon was banned from Cardiff matches. He had to the far-right group Combat 18. He also knew Darren Wells. Euro 2000 was just going to be like France 98. I looked at it and I thought, well, I didn't get into France 98. You know, the police won that little battle. But I'm determined to get into, into Brussels, which is why I left days before the game. Even on the way into, into London, you, know, you start thinking, you know, this could either be the start of the greatest week of my life or I could be coming home in half an hour. Wells and Weldon travelled on the Eurostar. Police were checking lists of suspected hooligans. When you get to the barrier and you're going through it, you just think, this is it any minute now, they're just going like, to pull you to the side and, you know, say, you know, sorry, you're not, you're not going, or they're going to take your passport, or they're going to take you into custody. Weldon, then on bail for football-related charges, was supposed to have reported the same morning to his local police station. Wells, too, had a conviction for public disorder. Both men had tickets with false names. No one checked them against the names in their passports, so they got through. It was a mixture of being surprised, elated, but still semi-apprehensive because that's just half the, the battle. We, you know, you still got to get off the other end at Brussels. Going abroad of England is just the biggest buzz of all. Weeks and weeks before a specific away match, all the, the papers in that country and it'll all be like, that the English are coming to town, the English are coming to town, everybody get ready, what are we going to do when the English are here? And, and it builds up that emotion. You're actually going off to war, you know, you're travelling to continental Europe in defence of England. So you, you hit these continental lands, and we've got nothing in common with these people, continental Europeans, innit? You know, they hate us and we hate them, and that's fine. You know, we're the most detested race in, in Europe, and I love it. It's just the way it should be. English police, known as spotters, were in Brussels, liaising with the Belgians to help identify known troublemakers. All the governments, if you like, chickened out of taking away somebody's liberty who was trying to get abroad and was a convicted hooligan. And so what we ended up with was all the people would get there anyway somehow. So we then started to see people arriving in the town, we recognised them, we knew where they were, we knew where they'd meet, and we knew roughly where the problems would start. I got messages from people that were already in Brussels prior to me, saying that they would be meeting at O'Reilly's. There was all kinds of firms in Brussels at that stage, teams like Huddersfield, Wolves, Burnley, Oldham, you meet in the middle of the city, putting on the biggest show that you can. The other English fans will come in and join you, and, every, and all that the locals can see that you're there, and they can try and be as obnoxious as possible, as early as possible. It's a cross between people who are totally in fear of us, and we're like a circus act. We're thoroughly ashamed, for a start, trying to explain that these were English 
them, but, but all English people aren't like that. It's very, very difficult. We are all then tarred with the same brush of these, of these, these horrible people. By Friday afternoon, everyone realised that, you know, that, that all the pubs were just full of different, different firms in each pub, and everyone just knew that it would just be the slightest thing that would spark it off. There were just too many English there for it, for it not to go off. Filming this group, English police spotters see another face from the Cardiff football sheet. Anis Abraham, a millionaire businessman. Wearing a black shirt, he's talking to a group from Blackburn. There's an argument. Abraham gets pushed back. He lashes out. The spotters talk about arresting him. It's the first fight of the day. Abraham is defiant. He was involved in the, in the center of, uh, of the activity. He was well known to us, but he came from, from nowhere um, in that we were watching the other leaders in that group from other clubs, and he sort of came in on it, and that was the meeting over there where, where he first was seen to be involved. The fighting spreads. Plainclothes Belgian police move in. But I was drinking on the other side of the town centre. We got phone calls saying it was all getting lively at O'Reilly's. And we weren't anticipating that to happen until midnight. But uh, we decided we'd, we'd head down that way. A short walk from the main square, many known hooligans were gathering. Some were from Cardiff. But among them, Martin Fielding, a far-right activist from Oldham. With the Cardiff group, Anis Abraham, and surprisingly, Di Thomas. Surprising because he was a professional footballer with Cardiff City. A match between France and the Czech Republic has just finished on TV in the bar. The French were playing and they scored a, a goal and won a game and they came out of a bar uh, shouting for the French and that was ready-made for the hooligans who were in a bar opposite and they dived in on them and that started the first part of the interesting rioting which was uh, them and us, us and the police, we'll do some damage, we'll throw at the police and we'll get everybody involved. At the front, known hooligans from Cardiff, Oldham and other smaller clubs. The riot police close in. Abraham is standing with some of the English group. He shouts towards the police lines. Some attack O'Reilly's. Among them, Oldham's Martin Fielding and Di Thomas, the footballer. Anis Abraham, the Cardiff millionaire, is also there. All three are figures that will soon feature in events back home. The rest of the mob then rampage for several hours. The police send in tear gas. Soon the hooligans regroup outside another bar. Some are still looking for trouble and for fights with passers-by. Bottles and chairs are thrown. Some hooligans flee into a bar as the police start to move in. They just flooded that particular back street. That we, they're both ends of it, and another lot in backup. There was just no, there was no way out. So it's just futile to you know to do anything. Then you just got to accept you. That's the end of your tournament. And the next thing, two Belgian police came back through for about three or four people, and then my legs just went up, my head went down, and the next thing, everyone else was just told to sit down, and they were whacking people. As glasses are being thrown at the window from the inside, police decide to fire tear gas into the bar. The England fans inside spill out. Police accept that many apparently innocent supporters may be arrested. But there were many faces who had been involved in the trouble earlier. Among them, Thomas the footballer. 
police started bringing trucks up, ferrying us back to a, uh, it was like an army barracks or something like that, police barracks. And they was getting us out one or two at a time and setting us up against this wall with a water cannon. So we're in a big line now, about 150, 200 of us. Di Thomas is brought into the station, but gives a false name. Also arrested Martin Fielding from Oldham. The next day in Charleroi, England played Germany. Those representing England's World Cup bid were hoping the early good humour would last. It didn't. The incidents were minor to those in Brussels, but this time the world was watching. You just felt that that was it. I mean, I, I wanted to give up at that particular point because I just knew uh, that the impact that that was likely to have on our 2006 World Cup campaign. And it was an awful thought, given all the work that had been put in to that 2006 campaign by so many people. Tony Blair heard the news at a European summit. What we've got to do is to obviously look and see what it is that we can, we can do for the future to make sure that this can't be repeated. But it is important to emphasise that the vast majority of these people, so far as we're aware, weren't on any intelligence records at all. You could walk down that group and you could go Middlesbrough, Tottenham, Leeds, Oldham, Shrewsbury, Newcastle. You could go down the line and you could pick out the groups of people who are known troublemakers. And are you going to apologise to the Belgian Prime Minister? I certainly deeply regret the behaviour of a small group of people who aren't really football fans at all. They're hooligans who disgrace and shame this country. The only thing that gets you through when you're in jail is the thought of Tony Blair having to stand up in Parliament and apologise to another country because of what I've done. I just, I just think it's fantastic. The more damaging our actions, the better it is. Hundreds were soon deported, though only one person has ever been prosecuted for the Belgium riots. Four weeks later, at the headquarters of World Football in Switzerland, the England bid team went to hear the result. The government had passed new laws removing hooligans' passports, but by then, it was too late. And the winner is Deutschland. That was fantastic. I think it was the best thing that could have happened. But we wouldn't want the World Cup in England. The World Cup is something you build up for and you look forward to travelling to, like Germany, World Cup 2006, and they're going to be in Germany. The thought of playing the Germans in Munich or you know, playing the Dutch in Stuttgart. It's much more appealing to travel over there and, you know, on, on a crusade than, than to play him in Coventry. I mean, who wants to go to Coventry? God, man. Back home, most of those involved in the trouble melted away. But Cardiff City couldn't ignore what had happened. Just on the corner there. Pull away, die. Pull away, die. Finish it's it. striker, a former Wales under-21, Di Thomas had been recognised in Brussels. He was under pressure to explain his involvement. He denied any part in the events. His spokesman even said he was nowhere near them. It was only when footage from Belgium was later released, showing Thomas being disorderly and ripping up fencing, that Cardiff City fined him £3,000 and suspended him. He never played for the club again. Anis Abraham, the millionaire who travelled to Brussels with Thomas, was also shown among the rioters. Abraham was a well-known local businessman with a passion for Cardiff City. His family's businesses were worth millions and he had a comfortable lifestyle to show for it. He'd once offered to help buy a player for the club. But police had also regularly seen Abraham at matches with convicted hooligans. He is a well-known figure. He has been on the scene in Cardiff uh, for a long, long time. Um, and again, um, uh, has in the past been present um, when violence has taken place. 
Now, there's no evidence to suggest he's directly involved uh, in that violence, uh, but his presence uh, continually up until uh, last season, I must say, is, is questionable. Like Thomas, Abraham denied being involved in the trouble. He said, if I was throwing punches, then I should be banned, but I wasn't doing anything. Cardiff City, who may not have seen the footage, took no action. But Abraham had been present at several points in the rioting. He was gassed in the Fiacre bar, where he tried to avoid the cameras and arrest. He wasn't arrested, but was taken briefly to hospital. Within months of Euro 2000, Cardiff City had a new owner, one with a unique approach to hooliganism. Sam Hammam was a Lebanese-born property developer. When Sam Hammam arrived in Cardiff, it was, um, it was interesting because, of course, it meant investment. You as a man who was going to invest substantial sums of money uh, in a, what was an alien football club. Hammam, who had once owned Wimbledon Football Club, seemed as at home among supporters as in the boardroom. He's not like that at all. His style when meeting fans was unorthodox. We tell everyone we're fucking sheep shaggers. Hammam started to befriend other prominent supporters. At a fans meeting attended by at least one band hooligan, Hammam is seen here with Anis Abraham. They're discussing going on to a local nightclub. See you later. See you later. We saw the pictures from uh, Brussels and, uh, and we saw uh, Anis's involvement in what was happening there. Um, and it was a uh, concern of ours uh, that the um, owner, uh, a very prominent owner uh, of a football club, so should be seen to be so closely associated uh, with someone who has, um, if not directly, uh, indirectly, connections uh, with those responsible for football violence. Sam Hammam soon travelled across South Wales, meeting fans who were directly involved in violence. He said this was part of a new approach, to try to rid the club of hooliganism by reaching out to the perpetrators. He said of hooligans, you have to get into somebody's mind. A lot of those people have reasons why they behave the way they do. He's spoken of taming hooligans with love and hugs. Bring me the biggest nutter, he said, and I will change him. And he didn't just talk. He gave some jobs. Sam Hammam's new head of personal security was a convicted football hooligan. We can't name him for legal reasons. But Hammam's policy of trying to reform hooligans raised serious concerns. He believes in rehabilitation. Now, I'm not against that. I think that's got its proper place. But to bring people who have clearly been involved, directly and indirectly, uh, in football hooliganism into the heart of a football club is really, in my view, uh, almost endorsing their behavior. And the club had an odd response to police requests. Stoke City's ground, the Britannia Stadium. A month before Euro 2000, Cardiff fans rioted in some of the worst football disorder in years. Now under Sam Hammam, Cardiff City refused police requests to publish sheets of suspects in their match day programmes. Meetings are arranged that, that were either delayed or postponed. Um, there seemed to be a reluctance on the part of the club um, to step into the spotlight and condemn what had happened uh, at Stoke. Uh, in fact, at one stage it was suggested by the club that much of the trouble was actually caused by the police themselves uh, in Overzadlisi. But the club was prepared to help others. This was a suggestion uh, by the club that they would in fact provide um, legal assistance and legal representation for anybody who was arrested um, as a result of the inquiry at Stoke. I was entirely flabbergasted by that. Now that's not to say that all were guilty, but I'm sure that the in identifying the individuals are very clear, unequivocal uh, video evidence of those individuals engaged in, in acts of violence. So the club's response 
was to the least surprising. Around 70 Cardiff supporters received bans from this one match. The club currently has almost 100 bans, the highest in the football league. We couldn't meet Cardiff City's conditions for giving us an interview, but the club has said it would publish pictures of suspected hooligans if police agreed to be liable for any complaints. Because of these concerns, Stoke Police say they printed a separate sheet, but Cardiff never put it in their match programmes. By the end of last season, Hammam had brought Abraham and another face known to the police into the heart of the club, John Simmons. Simmons has previous convictions, though not football related. This is police footage of him goading rival supporters. Having just won promotion to Division 2, Simmons and Abraham took part in a special coach trip to see a match against Man Town. Hammam posed on board with the Soul Crew. The pictures were posted on a Soul Crew website under the heading Sam and the Boys, with all faces except Hammam's hidden. The coaches stopped off at this hotel near Mansfield. Inside, Hammam posed again with the group. The reception was reported as another attempt by Hammam to improve hooligan behavior. He said he was proud to travel with the Soul Crew. I don't think we should court these people in providing them with coaches to travel away to, uh, to games, um, to provide them with entertainment, to provide them with alcohol, for example. Uh, I think that's going too far. And again, it's open to, to much misinterpretation, not just by us the, in terms of policing and, and the other authorities, but by the other supporters themselves. I know that many of the supporters in Cardiff are very unhappy uh, in what Sam Haman did. And Hammam's attempts to reform hooligans with champagne had mixed results. Among those present, Di Thomas, the ex-footballer, John Simmons's son Lee, and others who have all since been convicted. John Simmons, too, is hardly reformed. We've secretly filmed him on the hunt for trouble at matches. Here he's at Wrexham, part of a group pushed back by police dogs as it tries to reach the Wrexham fans. The same group then chants Soul Crew at rival hooligans. And Simmons has been meeting hooligan friends from further afield. Before a game in London, he's chatting with Matthew Marion of the far-right Combat 18 group banned from football matches and seen in the Brussels riots. We've witnessed him with Marion more than once, and with another Combat 18 member, Darren Wells. Simmons is one of the top boys down at Cardiff. He's just well respected by all the different firms. When anyone who knows of Cardiff knows of Simo, he's just got that reputation about him. Simo just knew me as a like C18, rather than any football club. Wells and the network of Combat 18 hooligans had also been active since Euro 2000, this time with far more serious social consequences. These were the worst race riots in Britain for nearly 20 years and shocked the nation. But there was another story behind the racial unrest, the seeds of which were exploited by hooligans in the weeks before. At Oldham Athletic, there are a small number, perhaps 30 or 40, who make up the hardcore hooligan group. One on the phone in the centre is a familiar face, Martin Fielding. And I've known Martin for quite a few years, through football stuff and political stuff, and he's always respected on both fronts. And he's just a game lad at football. One of, the, one of the top faces up at Oldham. Martin Fielding was also arrested and deported after rioting at Euro 2000. Oldham's firm are called the Fine Young Casuals, and there was certainly a racist element within the FYC. 
the 2001 football season coincided with rising racial tension in Oldham, which some football hooligans were looking to exploit. The Oldham lads were saying all the time that there was stuff happening that wasn't being reported and you know, Asians were attacking whites. White lads were fighting with Asian lads all the time. So we knew that something was going on in Oldham long before the press knew. Um, it was no surprise to us when Oldham exploded. It took a football match to spark it. Oldham were at home to Stoke City. There was trouble before the game as hundreds of Stoke hooligans arrived. First I heard of it was from the Oldham lads. One of them phoned me up and um, said that Stoke were up here. That Stoke were turned up and it's absolutely going wild with the police and everything. Earlier that week, an Oldham pensioner, Walter Chamberlain, was mugged by two Asian youths. Although his family denied it was a race attack, it got national coverage, fueling unproven allegations of no-go areas for whites. The Stoke hooligans came to confront the Asians. And the Stoke lads called this um, moment of one of the Oldham boys and just said, look, we don't want to have it with you. We're here to have it out with the packies because of what happened to that old guy, which was Walter Chamberlain. It's like, great. They all joined up and they marched through uh, the big Asian estate down there. They finally had the upper hand on the police. No one could control them. It was just like a free, you know, 10 minute run around. As the police tried to regain control, Leading members of the Oldham hooligan firm, the FYC, like this man on the left, Kevin Goff, were arrested. Once in the ground, the taunting continued. Though there was some Stoke and Oldham supporters chanted racist abuse. Asian youths were determined to stop the hooligans going through their community after the game. If they come here, we are not going to back down. We don't want the violence, but we are not going to back off. We're not going to hide in our houses. We are going to defend ourselves. Yes. You know, our families, they are scared. Yes, oh, we are going to defend our jumping. families. At the end of the match, some of the hooligans attempted to rush towards the Asians. A Molotov cocktail was thrown, apparently by Asian youths. The police pushed the white hooligans away. Then they attempted to disperse the Asians. But to them, it appeared the police were taking the hooligans' side. The Oldham lads were just like euphoric about what happened. The word started spreading around, you know, right wing circles. And again, people were delighted at that and they thought, well, this is it. We have to get up next week and we'll, you know, we'll do it all again. And this could be the start. This could stir it all up. Let's, let's finally have it out with the Asians once and for all. <laughs> People started making phone calls from one, one right-wing firm to another right-wing firm and different hooligan groups, different football teams, you know, like Stockport, Raffone, Shrewsbury, people from Man United, Chelsea, West Ham. Quite a few different clubs were phoned. One week later, hooligans from around the country gathered at the club. It was quite a scary place to be. You could just feel the tension as soon as you got into the, into the town. I mean, there were police around, there was white groups, there were Asian groups, there were gangs of anti-fascists walking around. We know for a fact that there are at the moment um, some members of Combat 18 and other football hooligans who have wanted to come into the area to try and whip things up. The Centurion was arranged as a venue by Oldham hooligans, among them Martin Fielding. Also present was his friend Darren Wells, though unknown to Fielding, Wells had become an informer. I was all for diffusing the situation, and um, in times gone past, I'd have all been for escalating it. But um, I, I wanted out of it, and I, I knew that my future um, laid elsewhere. But I could see some people that I really cared a lot about, some good friends of mine, that were getting dragged down this path, and it was only heading one way. They were going to end up dead or in jail. Weeks later, at another pub, the same core group of Oldham hooligans and other right-wingers met up again. Martin Fielding was there, so was a nervous Darren Wells. 
But the people just there wanted to put themselves on show by being in the junction, right on the edge of that Asian estate. It was almost the point of goading the Asians in a have to coming out. And then the police turned up and they blocked off the whole estate and just refused us permission to walk through that estate, which um, I was quite relieved about. The heavy police presence was no accident. Unknown to us, Wells had been providing crucial information to the anti-fascist charity Searchlight for some time. Here, he's phoning his contact who passes details of their movements to the Asian community and to the police. I was just trying to keep the two groups apart, to keep the, you know, the, the whites and the Asians apart, if you like, uh, because that had the potential to be horrendous, because there were, there were some serious, serious people from C18 and serious people from Oldham, you know, and, and, and that could have got really out of hand. After Wells' tip-offs, Fielding and the others can be seen walking back into town. But within hours, a fight in this road would spark serious disorder. We decided to leave and head back to London. And then while we were driving back to London, we started getting some phone calls from the lads still up in Oldham. That, uh, that, that, you know, a few things had happened. There'd been a, one of the lads, is, one of the Oldham lads, his family had been attacked. So some of the Oldham lads all, all went up there. Some of the Oldham football lads all went up there to, the, to defend the house and they got in a fight with some Asians and the whole thing escalated. And then the next thing, one of the Asian estates went up in flames. That evening, rioting started in Glodick, a largely Asian estate. It lasted all night. We were just stunned by it. the time I got home at 10.30 at night, put on the news, and there was pictures of Oldham burning. And I'd only been there like three hours before. It was just, I was glad to be at home. Wells had been providing important information for years to his anti-fascist contacts and through them to the police. But his reaction to that night's events showed his continued ambivalence to violence. Part of me was relieved that I was out of it and at home and wasn't going to be arrested. And then part of me was just, just excited because it's, it's just violence and sporadic violence, you know, just unplanned, spur-of-the-moment violence. It's just the same as hooliganism. To many hooligans, whether in Brussels, Oldham or elsewhere, the lure of violence once experienced is intense. And at Cardiff City, it was to test Sam Hammam's policy of rehabilitation in a very public way. The Cardiff City hooligans, the Soul Crew, have continued to be active this season. We filmed undercover as a hundred or so were escorted by police to a match at Bristol City. Abuse was hurled at rival fans. <laughs> and some were organising a fight with the Bristol hooligans. <laughs> and you've got 20 boys on your right hand side. So have a look, say have a look. Just say have a look. Yeah, All right, we'll have a look. All right, we'll have a look. For some, the match at Bristol City's ground was simply a brief lull before the coming fight. What followed was depressingly inevitable. Watching nearby was one of Hammam's associates, Anis Abraham, the millionaire seen throwing a punch in Brussels. His colleague had just been in the fray. He commented on the night's events. You're creating an atmosphere where serious problems can develop. And it's no accident that since Euro 2000, some of the most serious incidents on, this, on the mainland of Britain have been Cardiff City. And that the largest number of hooligans that can be turned out probably sometimes is Cardiff City Football Club. It's the weekend after Christmas, and Bristol City fans have travelled to Cardiff's ground for the return match. Inside Ninian Park, the atmosphere was heated. Cardiff 
Cardiff fans threw coins and bottles filled with urine. Missiles were thrown back. There were missiles being thrown uh, throughout the game and, and, and I'm not naive enough to know that we weren't um, uh, dispatching some ourselves or throwing back what came. Um, but again, uh, speaking to, to, to the fans that were there, um, they, they felt they were under constant uh, barrage of missiles. Cardiff went 3-1 down. Oh, and the atmosphere became more vicious. On, Cardiff fans broke up chairs to throw at the Bristol supporters. Then hurled racist abuse. Yeah, 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 you motherfucker. Oh, but the Cardiff City stewards ignored both criminal offences. Instead, they shared jokes with one supporter about throwing chairs. Yes, yes. At the end, Cardiff hooligans invited their Bristol counterparts to fight outside. You don't go to any uh, away ground where there's rivalry between the teams without expecting a few insults. That, that goes with the patch, but this went beyond that in, in a large way. And the sheer volume of coins, and then in the car park, the stones that were, were thrown around. Police tried to clear the car park, but a mob confronted them. Put your sticks down! Come on. Let's fucking have it! At the front, chanting Soul Crew, was Di Thomas, the former Cardiff City footballer turned hooligan. And the Cardiff hooligans weren't afraid to attack the police. A vicious battle followed. A club photographer was knocked unconscious. Some fans tried to help him. He's not a fucking old Bill, you twat! He's coming back! Fighting spilled into the streets. Bottles and bricks were hurled. Around a hundred cars were damaged. But apart from our own, there were no TV cameras. So the events were never reported. Just a week later, the national press did descend on Ninian Park to see Leeds United, then top of the Premier League, play Cardiff in the FA Cup. Hammam seemed delighted the match was being played at Cardiff's ground, comparing its atmosphere to others notorious for violence. It's uh, better for us to play them at Ninian because the uh, intimidatory factor will be so big. It's a huge, huge advantage. I mean, any team that come here will tell you uh, what the atmosphere is like. It's, uh, it's a bit like the old den at Millwall, except ten times more. If that's what he said, that's just totally irresponsible. Somebody like that, after making those comments uh, and after seeing what's happened, shouldn't be allowed to work in football. If, there's, if there are, if there is uh, any justice in the world, then he's just totally undermined all the hard work, difficult work done by all the good football clubs, and there are plenty of those. Um, uh, and encouraged a lot of the worst part of football to think, hey, we're all right now, we're being supported. On match day, many Leeds fans had little idea what awaited them. As soon as we got in there, I could hear screaming, shouting. It was just a complete atmosphere of tension, that's where I'd put it. It was just horrible. Before kickoff, Hammam went to the visiting supporters' end with his bodyguard, the convicted hooligan. He raised a placard saying, Welcome Leeds. Coins were thrown back. Some Cardiff fans hurled abuse. The Cardiff fans are extremely close to us as well. I thought, oh, I don't like this. This is a bit scary. And also, within minutes, there was things being thrown. We had coins coming over and bottles and all sorts of things. 
I just couldn't believe it. I thought, well, they're going to stop that in a minute. They're going to go in and they're going to stop it. But they didn't. There was just, there was bottles coming over, screwed up tin cans like this. So they were very sharp. They were being thrown. They were, I mean, I got hit at least five times by coins. After an early Leeds goal, Cardiff equalised. Leeds fans were pelted with bottles and coins, as was the referee. The match was briefly stopped. One man came over to us with a little boy. He said, I'm being hit from that side. I said, stand next to me because I've been hit at least five times. And he said, well, what am I going to do? This little boy was really crying. He was upset. He was terrified. And into this maelstrom, Hammam stepped forward again, walking past the Leeds fans with his bodyguard. Again, he was pelted. With minutes to go, Cardiff scored their winning goal. An incredible act of giant killing. Some Leeds hooligans attempted to break out of the ground to confront Cardiff supporters. But the police line held. Cardiff fans wanted to join their chairman on the pitch. When the final whistle went, we could see all the Cardiff fans just jumping over the fences, jumping over the barriers. And then finally they opened the gates and just let them out. Many went straight for the Leeds end. A mass brawl with Leeds fans was only averted by the fact that Ninian Park still has fencing. And by a forceful police intervention. It was terrifying, absolutely terrifying. All sorts of kids crying, screaming. It was just terrifying. As missiles flew between both sides, outside some children were leaving in tears. The Leeds fans were furious. You don't fuck all about it. Sorry, love. So would I, love. So would I. I've got my son as well. Right, you saw your fucking lot out. And once again, the tension threatened to spill into more violence. Others had more serious injuries. Hey, so we're just going to get her on the bus. I was the first bus. A brick come and smashed her on the head. That happened at Leeds. We'll be kicked out at Leeds. But you're a joke. If this is Cardiff, if this is hospitality, shove it up your ass. One radio reporter tried to interview Sam Hammam. I wanted to know what he thought of the scenes on the final whistle, and it became pretty clear at the start of that interview that he didn't wish to condemn that behaviour. I challenged him on this, continued to challenge him throughout the course of the interview. When Sam Hammam closed the interview after I'd interrupted him for the final time, he took my tape recorder, gave it to one of his security officials, who then ushered me down the tunnel. When I got to the entrance to reception, I was grabbed by my coat and flung quite forcefully out of the gates of Ninian Park. Five days after the match, and still stung by the mass media outcry, Hammam called a meeting of the club's core supporters. In the audience, Anis Abraham the millionaire and John Simmons. Cardiff City's owner was here to rally the troops. All this media campaign, this, this vile and evil and lying, I mean, they're really, really trying to come after the club and after me. Has this been good for the club? It has been great. He accepted that his club had a hooligan problem and that Cardiff fans who threw missiles should be rooted out. But he felt the media had unfairly singled out the club, that the Leeds fans were worse. He turned it into low comedy. There were a lot of empty uh, plastic bottles. One threw a cigarette lighter. And one threw his fucking shoes. <laughs> <laughs> so, can they charge us with anything? With what? And if they say there was virus and I incited virus, I'm asking you, what fucking virus? Who hit who after the game? Who fought who? There was no violence. I didn't incite anything. These people are will come, they are with us. Now, we, we have been set up. It, then then he referred to John Simmons, known as Simo. We should be whiter than white. Just as an example, Simo, where are you, Simo? <laughs> 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 
Hamam tacitly acknowledged Simmons' role in trouble by asking him to keep his nose clean from now on. At the end, the club's chief executive is filmed in deep discussion with John Simmons and with Anas Abraham. The next day, Sam Hamam went on the offensive, launching what he described as his war on violence at the club. Thank you very much, Some are not convinced. Thank you for coming. Are you right? What I am saying is that's the words, where's the action? Uh, and in my experience, in the time I was here in Cardiff, I saw very little action, albeit sometimes a few words. Where does Sam Hamam come in from? Um, what is his view? I mean, why, why is he so closely involved with these groups? Cardiff City has condemned hooliganism on several occasions, mainly after the Leeds match, when it launched a fan's charter to report, then ban for life, those seen throwing objects inside the ground. But this spring, at the official Cardiff Club shop, you can buy a copy of a new book. It's a historical celebration of the Cardiff hooligans, the Soul Crew. Have you got a copy of the uh, Soul Crew book? No. At first it's hard to get, but it's available from the manager. How much is it? Eight. Eight. Nice. So why are you selling behind the counter though? Can't sell them either. Why is that? Because of the shit that's in there, basically. Yeah. It's not, you know, it's a good read. I've had a read of it, and there's yeah. nothing, nothing heavy, but uh, yeah, right. it's just the club don't want to be seen to be selling that type of thing because it glorifies the violence and all the rest of it. But the club are okay to sell it, though? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. It's you know, perfectly uh, yeah. legitimate. The book that Cardiff City are selling is written by a soul crew hooligan. Tony Rivers, who we've seen active this season. You know, fucking stood there, like we went all to him, bang, bang, they were gone, run back into the escort, like, funny as fuck. Where is he? Where is he? Far from being whiter than white, John Simmons is still trying to confront other supporters. We filmed him with other Cardiff hooligans looking for Chesterfield fans at an away fixture in March. Yeah, come on, let's get back up here. I'm telling you, that's their pub up there, that's the pub. There were clashes before and after the game. <laughs> Di Thomas, the ex Cardiff City footballer, was jailed after the Cardiff Leeds match. He'd run onto the pitch and thrown missiles. He's banned from football grounds for six years. And Darren Wells, once of Combat 18, is now abroad, hiding from his former friends. It's obviously had a detrimental effect on my life. What's done's done, isn't it? You've got to stand by that. But I don't know what people would do if there was no football. If they took away football, people would just start following something else. People would just go off at cricket or something. It's just, you can't ever lose it. Next week, foreign fields. The power that hooligans exert over two of the world's biggest clubs. We go undercover in Rome with the Ultras of Lazio, perhaps the most organized and political hooligan group in the world. And to Boca Juniors in Argentina, whose hooligans are friends with the world's most famous player, Diego Maradona. Digital viewers can join the discussion about issues raised on tonight's programme by pressing the red button.